Hello, and in the morning, I am Nicholas Childs, and I want to give you this talk today about uh, basic 101 bus systems. So don't fear the bus. It won't run you over. So legalese, I will let you know, don't be evil. I'm not encouraging bad things. It's for educational purposes only. Uh, you're going to see a patch coming up on the next screen, and the story of the patch is 2018, we deployed. That was when we bombed Syria as the 28th bomb wing. Um, me and a bunch of other airmen as part of the offensive avionic systems, which is what we are, ComNav Wizards, we created that patch. Uh, so this talk is not sanctioned or sponsored, but it is approved by the United States Air Force. And are, are there any pilots in the house? Yep, yep, well, screw you, screw all of you. All right, you made my life a living hell for the last 20 years, so I'm taking this exact moment to tell you, screw you. And um, follow it with me, okay? Input validation is not a thing. It will come up. So who am I? I'm Nicholas Childs. I'm a security manager, OAS, B1 systems controller, TODO, forklift operator, bus driver, customs inspector, CSL, cut train, crew chief, commercial aircraft servicing technician, and a retiree and an intern. Uh, I will put this talk on my GitHub as soon as I get done with it, just a PDF version. And uh, you can contact me on Twitter or my email. I'm perfectly happy to speak with any of you about aircraft avionic systems as long as it's, I don't get in trouble for talking to you about it, you know. So uh, also a little bit more information about me. I am currently an intern with Full Circle Communications LLC. I have 20 years experience in communication navigation systems. Um, I have an aeronautical engineering degree. Uh, yeah, that's right. I got my associates. Heck yeah. I have a mechanical repair and servicing experience with 737s, L1011s, DC-10s, and 747s. I'm proficient with multiple airframe avionics systems, uh, C-17, C-5s, C-141s, yes, I'm that old, KC-135s, and B-1s, which are a piece of crap. I have five years experience as an active directory administrator in the DOD network, and I have multiple cybersecurity certifications. I'm telling you a freaking lie, they're all expired. And I have an FCC radio telephone operator license with a radar endorsement. That's my wizard degree. And yeah, that's it. So my original why, I put this talk together because things are broken. Avionics bus systems were designed for use, not for security. Like most legacy systems, <clears throat> ICS, the addition of new technologies has introduced vulnerabilities. I need your help or we're all gonna die. But I did calm down a little bit once I saw some projects come out and people actually going more into the systems that I've been talking about in the first place. So I have a new why. Avionics bus systems and integrated flight management systems now seem to be things of magic. So let's demystify and educate. I promise we can easily learn things that high school educated airmen know. Not as painful as you think. Additionally, input validation is not a thing. So I say viewers like you, because without y'all support, I could not have put this together. Uh, there's been a lot of things that uh, people have exposed over the last few years, and I'm absolutely loving it, seeing things that I've been worried about being in the military and seeing them come to fruition, uh, especially publicly, because that means they can be repaired. Uh, so if any of y'all have questions or whatever, you can contact me, as I said at the beginning of the slide. Please do. I would love to have a conversation with you, because I might be having questions with you about a lot of this stuff especially when you go into the weeds with the vulnerabilities. So we're going to go over the history of aircraft networking systems, communications along those bus systems, a few networks you should know about, and attack vectors and upgrades. So not good with this type of stuff. So we'll go over the original things. This is the history of aircraft network systems. So you have a distributed analog, that's your old school straight wire to wire, uh, distributed digital, they actually had a different communication network along those wires. They were able to cut the wires down from being physical to, to and then sending signal along it. Federated digital, that's what I was used to working in when I first joined the military, uh, 1553 and stuff. And then the integrated modular, which was introduced in the 1990s. So the federated digital and integrated modular is still popular today, and you'll find that on a lot of systems still in the air. So the original distributed analog, had dedicated wiring, had dedicated power supplies, uh, sensor excitation. So basically whatever the sensor is receiving is sitting directly to the indicator. Uh, there's no in between, there's no communication. It's just plus or minus voltages, you're good to go. 
Uh, you'll see that a lot with the ILS systems. Um, they upgraded this from there, but that's just the way it is. Dedicated LRUs and subsystems, dedicated displays and controls, some standard interfaces, but very few. You go on to the distributed digital, and as I said, this decreased the wires, but it just didn't change a whole lot because you did not have a network, you just had individual items. Communication between major units via serial data buses. Uh, you had dedicated wiring, digital processing used for control functions, software programmable off aircraft, which means you could actually upgrade the software on the LRUs. Uh, dedicated LRU subsystems, increased use of standard interfaces, increased accuracy and performance over the old analog system. So with the network interchangeable with the federated digital, this is your network buses. This is where things started. Uh, it's as hot swappable LRUs. You have full power on, you can actually swap LRUs around. Uh, future proof, when I say future proof, that just means that you can stack the newer systems on top of it. Software programmable on the aircraft, uh, instead of removing the, the item itself, you could actually plug into the network itself and update the item, the uh, LRU, depending on what it is. Increased accuracy and performance, performance increased crosstalk between devices. So there's a lot of crosstalk outside of the bus, but with this bus, it made it a lot simpler for uh, other systems to pick up on the information. Uh, one example is your air data computer, which we'll go over. And then the integrated modular architecture, use of COTS, commercial off-the-shelf system, and adapted IT bus technology, use of standard modules, aircraft-wide installed cabinet and racks, normal network, commercial off-the-shelf stuff, pertaining to aircraft system, the domain, uh, aircraft system domains, functionality imparted by portion software operating on common processors, reprogrammable on aircraft. So you'll have a radio set, a navigation computer, they'll have the same processor in them. So that allows a boilerplate when it comes to doing software updates and things like that, which is great for software engineers, but we all know the vulnerabilities that you have with standardization. So I wanted to give an example of a federated digital network just so y'all can see it all put together. Um, I created three layers on here that should make things a little bit simpler. We have a network layer, an LRU layer, line replaceable unit layer, and an interface layer. So on the network layer, we have an A and B bus with remote terminals. And the, uh, yeah, the remote terminals are impedance matching. They actually help with the network to communicate to the LRUs. It's kind of like a standardized thing. So it allows you to change those items out because you have the remote terminal that is connected directly to the bus. It also helps with voltage spikes and stuff. Uh, otherwise, we call it matching impedance. So every one of these networks, these legacy networks has a controller. It's a hub. Every communication on the network comes and goes to the controller. It comes from the controller and goes to the controller. So I'll repeat, every communication on that network, network comes from and goes to the controller. Uh, bus system errors are ignored and dropped and then tried again until they actually make communication. There are errors. I mean, voltages, stray voltages happen all the time on aircraft. Aircraft are incredibly noisy when it comes to voltages, uh, vibration, and everything else, if you can imagine. So we'll look at our layer two. Uh, in here, we have our line replaceable units. I've got a BSIU, a bus system interface unit, a radio set, just like your COM1 or COM2 radio, ADC, air data computer, MFD controller, that's your LRU that controls the back end for your MFDs, your multifunction displays, your TCAS, uh, transponder, and yeah, that's everything that I have in there. So I did put some cross lines on here, which don't show up on this slide, but they're basically between here and here and here and here. So there's a one way directional from the ADC to the transponder and from the transponder to the TCAS. Now what this gives you, so you have an air data computer, when you have a transponder getting pinged by a tower, it needs to know the location of the aircraft. They actually have communication going between the ADC and the transponder. It doesn't even talk on the bus. There is some on the bus, but there's some that are completely hardwired directly into it. Same thing with TCAS. It was kind of an ad hoc system, the traffic collision avoidance system. It was ad hoc, but it does rely on all information coming from the transponder for the aircraft locational data. But I wanted to point that out. Unfortunately, it didn't show up on my slide once I changed it over. But uh, there are one directional lines, just like you see here to the maintenance computer. That's what I have going from here to here and from here to here. So also there's uh, 
situations when we have radar systems that have a blanking line connecting that isn't part of the bus. It's a little line connected between the two systems so that whenever you're using one radar system, the other one turns off. Uh, there's a lot of that inside air, aircraft systems. There's a lot of communication that doesn't exist on the bus simply because of the uh, priority. And another good example, I'll explain when we get to the interface layer, layer three. So on the interface layer, we have a maintenance computer. Uh, it's also the maintenance recorder, the maintenance output. Um, a word about maintenance computer output, data validation is not a thing. Uh, we don't need another unit, just better codes for IDS. Now say I bring this up because a lot of people have said, what if we include an IDS and then an intrusion detection system on these uh, network systems on the aircraft, but you don't need it. You have a controller that receives all the information already. You have a maintenance computer that kicks out all the fault buses. It can also monitor all the traffic on there. Uh, most airframes that I've touched, they have uh, different types of records that allow you to record the traffic literally. So it's really just a creating a program in which we can see codes that we understand what injection looks like, code injection or a, a possible hack. You spit it out in the maintenance computer and then uh, maintainers will have an indicator. We can actually deal with it at that point in time. So the nice thing about this system is because of the way it is, it's sturdy as hell. You do not need to install a lot of new systems in it to have some kind of flexibility like that. But also on your layer three, you have an emergency comm controller. This is another one of those hardware devices, hard wired devices. So if uh, we lose all power except for 28 volts DC, which is scary, but that's what it's there for, you have a emergency comm controller that's connected directly to the radio set. It's not along a bus, it's not along anything else. There's not even any other wires to it. It may go through some bulkheads, but that's about it. It's connected that way so the pilot, the co-pilot can have communication. We all know how important that is. So also on this layer three, this is where COTS would be installed, commercial off-the-shelf systems. The cool thing about 1553, as I said, future-proof, you can put adapters on the layer two and then you can install COTS on layer three. Uh, I've seen this with other target acquisition systems that just happen to be modern and carried across multiple airframes. Um, as well as other radio sets, Combat Tracker 2, things like that. They exist as mostly commercial off-the-shelf systems, but they still communicate on the 1553 data bus. Uh, one thing also you can do with this is the OFP loading, operational flight plan. This goes back to the software loading for the individual LRUs. Um, typically, you'll have a maintenance computer or a uh, software loader where you will connect to and you flip a stem switch and it'll actually let you load the software onto these LRUs. But understand that that information is simply coming across that bus. So, you know, as we said, input validation is not a thing. So you can imagine what kind of mess you can make with that. Uh, as you can see, I put a box around the flight management system just to help understand a lot of stuff. With the data loader, you can load a lot of things uh, into the BSIU flight plans and stuff like that. And I know there's a lot of expansion with the electronic flight bag. Unfortunately, I've never touched one, but based on what I've worked with, I would understand that it would connect with the flight management system. Um, I did do a little bit of research, but I didn't want to talk too much about it because I've never had hands on with it. So I'm going to be asking you all a lot of questions about that when it comes around to it. And yeah, that's basically the federated digital um, network stack. So I want to give an example of the maintenance computer. As I said, it's very important to kind of live and die by this thing as maintainers. Uh, faults can ground an aircraft and we also use it for troubleshooting system. So I wanted to show you on the B1 is a SITS, the uh, Central Integrated Testing System. I can actually run ops checks from that panel. It's on the right side of the, the photo there, right over here. I can actually run ops checks right there and I can also look at maintenance data for faults and things like that along the bus. It helps me a tremendously when it comes to troubleshooting systems, knowing what to replace, what went wrong, and things like that. Um, data can also be offloaded from this from a, with a PCMCA card to a CDDS, which is the Deployable Diagnostic System. Um, and you can run a full test and things like that. It basically does snapshots of the aircraft in flight. And I know other frames do the same thing. They just have different acronyms for it. So we'll go over the different buses. There are many buses, but these ones are mine. Um, also, these are the only ones that fit on the slide deck. So we got the Mill Standard 1553, Federated Digital, ARINC 429, another example, Federated Digital, and the AFDX 
which is our integrated modular. So with the uh, MIL standard 1553 coded language, you got Manchester 2 encoding, uh, binary phase shift, BPSK. Uh, that means there's no null. It's just a positive or a negative in order to send. And as you can see, you have your one megahertz clock, and then these are the signals that are in there. One megabyte per second, accuracy of 0.01% short term and 0.1% long term. That's important. Uh, as I said, data can get dropped. And when data gets dropped, your bus controller is going to send information to your maintenance computer. I've also thought about what could you do if you can mess with packets enough to where you can denial a service in the entire network. So, you know, as I said, input validation is not a thing. So what if you could inject something in there to make it drop codes? Uh, the only thing you would need to know is the addresses on the network. And in some cases, you just need to make sure you're not hitting those addresses. It's a vulnerability I've always been a little bit afraid of. But each word is a 16-bit plus sync wave and parity. And this is what the packet itself looks like. So you have a sync, a time sync, and the command word. A remote terminal address of the LRU. That's your address, the LRU. Sub addresses, uh, as I showed you with the uh, CD8, CDU and stuff. Here, we'll go back. Sub address, because you have a network within a network. Information is going to the BSIU, and then it's also going to have to go to these items. That's where you have your sub network addresses. Also, if you have really complicated LRU, some of the modern LRUs actually have like a, a virtual sub network in them to give multiple commands. It's just because they're more complicated than the original 1553 data bus was. And uh, transmit receive, that's typically a, a off on bit to say, hey, transmit or receive. That's how important it is for comm. Uh, and then the sub address, as I was saying. So uh, data word, that is the packet itself, everything that's gonna be in there. Uh, 32 data words may be transmitted in any one message. And once again, as we said, input validation is not a thing. So now we'll go on to the Boeing standard, ARINC 429 coded language. This one does have a null byte. And as you can see uh, with the A and B, you have the exact opposite on the A and the B bus. This adds for that parity to make sure that you have a valid signal going across it. Um, you know, it has the same thing with some uh, errors. I don't know what the error validation is on this one because I haven't really messed with the system. But you have 32 words, 32 bits in a word, no more than 20 receivers on a single wire and it's unidirectional. On a wire, it only transmits one way, and it goes up to 100 kilobytes per second, 12.5 or 50, it just depends on how your setup is. Um, yep, and that's the basic of that. Here's the packet. It contains five fields to every word, five fields to every word, sorry. Parital, parity, sign, status matrix, data, source destination, label. So with the parity, it's for timing. SSM, as you can see right here, 31 and 30. That is your signal status matrix. Your data, that's the packet that you're gonna have. That's the information in the packet. Your SDI, source destination identifiers and label identifying data type. So if you understand the network on the system, maybe or maybe not injection can happen because input validation is not a thing. But this is what one of those networks looks like uh, when you're looking at an ARIMC bus. You have your general systems uh, when they do have commercial aircraft or military aircraft, but you still see everything is integrated along a normal data bus. So that's the problem I've always had. It's like, what if you can inject some stuff along, as long as you can get it on that bus and you know the addresses of things, you know, there could be some issues. This is now on to the AFDX, ARINC664. This is our modular system. It is the avionics full deep duplex ethernet switching. And it is the Airbus standard. It has 128 data terminals per controller, two megabytes per second. Each word is 32 bits and COTS integration. So with the other stuff, we had to do COTS with adapters, special LRUs, things like that. This is in the system itself because it speaks on TCP IP. Because it speaks on that, it's COTS integrated but you also know the dangers of bringing foreign devices and putting them on any network. Um, not a big fan of BYOD anyway. And inside this, this is the frame that we're gonna speak, the AFDX frame. AFDX frame is 8023 compliant. Layout is very similar to ethernet frame and can be transported via COTS, as I said. Uh, it exists on the OSI layer two. Uh, the structure of the IPv4 header remains unchanged. 
Yes. And as I said, input validation is not a thing. So yes, this is inside of a TCP IP packet when communicating on the ARN C664 network. So we went over the systems, some basic systems that I understand. There's, a, there's more out there, but these are primary, these are our main ones. So we're gonna go over commercial off the shelf devices, how they can be used as an attack vector, local data connections, uh, external data connections and people, always with the people. I do wanna change that to pilots because I know you guys really wanna mess my stuff up, but people in general, yeah, they, they are the worst thing we know for security. So we look at network hubs of, this is the commercial off the shelf system stuff. There's network hubs, USB hubs, literally commercial design for IT infrastructure. Surprisingly enough, COTS protocols and services as well. So there's a lot of stuff in there. So this laptop right here, I wanted to show this to you. This has, uh, you can see what Windows version is on there. Um, the username and password is underneath the sticky, which it makes sense because when it comes to maintenance, things have to be standardized for quickness. You know, I need to be able to hand this to an airman and hand them the book on how to do it. And I've seen the same thing with commercial aircraft. And then they go through and follow the instructions. Uh, the problem is, even on the 1553 data bus, whenever I was loading the OFP operational flight programs into stuff, which is just a software updates, it's for security, sustainability, sometimes adding new features. Um, they use standardized COTS that's not COTS, COTS services, I guess is the best way to put it. I've used FTP, SFTP, HTTP, Telnet, and SSH to move files around along that network. None of those are vulnerable at all, are they? Now, come on, say it with me again. Input validation is not a thing. So I wanted to give you a good picture of what this looks like. Uh, this is the USB, I mean, it says right there. Plug it into the uh, laptop and we're able to connect directly to the network and you run a few softwares in order to load things. Uh, so um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, this is whenever you have the standard processors and you're loading software on them. Uh, along the network. I just wanted to show you what the hardware looked like so you can get an idea. Uh, it also introduces attack vectors, as I was saying. Uh, what if I wanted to load some bad stuff in the inertial navigation unit or the air data computer or the primary flight computer? If they have a standardized this unit and I have physical access to the aircraft, um, I could quite possibly put some stuff in there to make it non-operational. And I have, some I have some examples of OFP and real world stuff uh, towards the end of the slide, just things that we've seen in the news and, and I've been able to summarize with my own research and stuff. So other things to look out for, maintenance data media, as I said, in my case, it was a PCMCIA. There's a lot of other airframes that use different stuff, hot swappable hard drives, USB cards and SD cards. I've seen many of those things used in laptops, connected to networks. It's that whole BYOD. You gotta make sure everything's sanitized before you bring it, but those are possible vectors. Now, so we go with external data connections as vectors. So sending the bus code directly to a component with a proper address and command for the spe specific bus. So, you know, if we could receive a CPDLC information, it is going along that bus. It's going along the main network system. So what would it take to inject some code into that? Because input validation is not a thing. Uh, I want to go over CPDLC, ACARS, and FANS, which is the future air navigation systems, because that's everything that we want to build on the future for making aircraft more safe. We're using FANS, and it's a very unstable system. I'll show you in just a second. Cool thing about CPDLC, uh, using text messages to take off and land. I don't know if I should bring this up, but someone at the talk, uh, Joshua Smales, from the University of Oxford, Oxford, is covering this very well. And I suggest that you watch this. Uh, we actually have the same resources when it comes to doing this on your own as well. But he broke down everything as, as I can imagine. It just It's exceptionally well put together and I enjoyed it. I got a lot of questions for you too, Josh. So it's gonna happen. Uh, CPLD, CPLDC, the Control Pilot Data Link Controller. I just wanted to show this to you. Um, it's running on VDL2, VHF Data Link 2. Uh, that's the problem, and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, as I said, it's used for sending clear messages back and forth. Uh, VHF band use, that's what the VDL2 is. And then ACARS, which is the Aircraft Communication Addressing Reporting System. I believe there was a talk about this last year 
the airframe that I worked on with ACARS was a C5 and it was used for weather updates. And all it did was print out a printer. But the problem is you can receive information through ACARS and the VHF data link and it's going across 1553 bus. So, you know, it's not secure. There's no way to secure it and any kind of code is in there. In fact, you can just receive it on your own. Uh, I believe there's a project in my notes here that lets you receive ACARS data if you like. So it's on VHF and HF, receive data to print the thermal paper. That's what I was talking about with the weather. Uh, relies on readily available commercial networks and also a VDL2 project. So I wanted to show you what FANS was, Future Air Navigation Systems. So a lot of new systems are gonna be coming out. They're gonna rely on this VDL2. Uh, so I have a feeling that if we understand VDL2 enough, we'll be able to take apart these systems like they need to be tested and looked at. So that's VHF limited to 200 nautical miles. Um, of an aircraft at 3,000 to 4,000 feet. And that's the project I was talking about, SCR Dump VDL2 on GitHub, and I do have a link to it. This is what the packet looks like. Uh, your transmitter, synchronization, reserve, length, header, data, uh, EEC data, and you have another data frame, and then the FEC, and an A85 bits. Now this is kind of confusing, but I actually have a better breakdown of it showing the network layers. Uh, one through seven of the application presentation session layer. Now, as I said, if you go to this, this project, you'll be able to understand this data link better, and you'll be able to take apart all these other systems that consist of the ACARS and the CPDLC, because they all rely on VDL2, uh, which is fine, but there are ways that we need to start encrypting it. Uh, Pre-shared key, I believe, is one of the suggestions made, and I, and that's, in my opinion, one of the best ways to go. I mean, it's worked out really well with IPv4, um, but overall, like the infrastructure of that, it's not very secure. So this is what we have. So these are the hurdles. If you want to hack aircraft, these are the hurdles. You have to understand the aircraft infrastructure that you're trying to hack. You have to understand specific components and their functions. You have to have physical access to a lot of the hardware. That's really hard. Aircraft components are very expensive and very difficult to get a hold of. Same with the testing tabletop access that software and hardware. I've actually been looking for 1553 uh, software. Everything runs on old Windows systems and I'm having a hell of a time because aeronautical engineers just tend to be that way. Uh, they've been putting a lot of things together on those older systems and all the older legacy systems and that's just the way they design stuff. Uh, also learning the insane amount of acronyms. I mean, you got VDL, ANDVT, UHF, EHF, INS, CADC, DFDR. You got all this stuff. You got to learn those acronyms. There's a lot of them to aircraft. Uh, but the SDR will open the door for many. Uh, and that's why I put the SDR projects in here. So addendums, things that are happening. These are things going on right now. A lot of you might be familiar with the Bombardier data link. Um, I went through it myself as a maintainer. And it's sensitive, but it didn't seem too bad. Uh, but I'm also not a really in-depth radar engineer. So what I found from it was, yeah, okay, now I know the center of gravity of the aircraft. Uh, and I know a data linkage at a certain um, flight position on the aircraft, but it really wasn't a lot from that. But in the future, there probably could be some more leaks that are more damaging than that. Uh, with the radar, all I saw was what the, the guide vane looked like. The, um, oh, I forgot, it was guide to where the RF goes through and the physical structure of it. But as long as I don't see the software structure, there's not a lot leaked there. So a good idea, so software, as I was saying, how sensitive the software can be. We all know that the 737 MAX accidents that were happening was because they did a physical change in the saw on the aircraft, but they didn't do an OFP upload. So what if you were to manage to get a hold of the legacy OFP loaded into an aircraft and now you've ruined it again? And that was all based off of center of gravity. Um, it's needed to understand how sensitive some of this information can be. And of course, uh, as of recently, the US government probes aircraft phones only a matter of time. They also understand this, that this is a very sensitive system. It is only a matter of time before we have some really bad vulnerabilities. And that's it. Uh, there is my references. I suggest y'all use them as much as you can. All the links still work, and this is an amazing amount of information. Even I still learn from it. Sometimes these are basically the white papers for a lot of things. Thank you, it was wonderful talking to you today.